Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here at my next Avatar Weekly Discussion Topic video. Today I'm going to be doing my kind of a preview for Legend of Korra Turf Wars Part 2. So where we're at with Turf Wars Part 2 is that uh, the release date is going to be January 17th in comic book stores, January 30th from everywhere else. Uh, we don't have preview pages yet, uh, I suspect they will probably go up potentially later on in the week, if not uh, next week. Um, I think the latest we've had them is like with just prior to the release, like a day or two before, but I don't really think they'll do that here. There of course was the issue with um, the fandom more or less compiling the entire book together from the Amazon preview, um, so maybe they're wanting to limit that by not putting up the preview as early as they otherwise would have. But we do have a product description for part two. So the description for part two says, Recovering from the fight and furious for revenge, th triple threat member Tokuga solidifies his ties with the duplicitous Wanyang. Meanwhile, when Republic City's housing crisis reaches, reaches its peak, Zhu Li sets her sights on the biggest public figure in the city, President Raiko, in a bid for the, pres in a bid for the presidency. Uh, with her friend's success, the future of the Spirit Portal and the well-being of Republic City citizens at stake can core remain neutral and fulfill her duties as the Avatar. So, a lot going on, um, and I suppose the, the easiest place to start is how does that relate to, I suppose, um, how Turf Wars Part 1 actually ended. And, yeah, the, the thing with Tokuga is that, yeah, he's been a uh, spirit kind of morphed, whatever way you really want to call it, he's been turned into half spirit i think is what they refer to him as in the in the part three description so i think immediately what you're gonna have to do with the main villain tokuga is over the course of part two somehow through either him saying it a spirit saying something to him or just through context from scenes somehow explain to the audience what how, how it really changes you when you're morphed into being half spirit. That's something that definitely needs to be brought up and addressed and I hope they manage to get around to it um, in the book but at the same time they're in the danger of potentially um, having the character be defined by what he is rather than who he is so they do still also need to develop Toku as a character as well as explain the mechanics of kind of what it means now that he's kind of part spirit. Um, because at the end of part one, he's blaming Korra basically for what happened, even though obviously Korra had basically nothing to do with what actually happened to him. He was fighting outside of the portal, the spirits defended the portal, they attacked him because he was clearly orchestrating the attack and got morphed because of that. Uh, so we'll have to obviously wait and see just exactly where they're really going with that, but um, it needs development. I, I, th I think you do need to really address where this guy came from, because part one basically just says he kind of came out of nowhere and kind of, you know, became the leader of the triple threats and kind of managed to lead them back into some level of success. And then they, they you know, solidifies his ties with the duplicitous Wang Yang. I didn't really get much from Wan Yang as a character from part one, so uh, they have a lot to do with him, and I don't know if they will do anything with him, so I don't really know why, at least right now, they seem to be presenting something bigger with him, because, like, there's still the whole amusement park thing, like, there's a lot going on here, and I don't know if it's necessarily the best focus, um, in that there's the amusement park, but... Now that kind of Tokuga's in control, does he, does he still want to do that? Um, or is Wanyang going to convince him? Or is Wanyang still going to be doing that in the background? It's it's kind of all over the place that, you know, the, they just presented that right at the end of like, oh, Wanyang hired the triple threats to, you know, scare off the airbenders and this is what's happened now. Tokuga's turned the tables. What does it actually mean now? Does Tokuga suddenly have the, the triple threats obviously now backed by like big business um, and they're even more of a threat or what? And where's the sp human spirit conflict coming into play here? Um, because obviously that, that's the thing I'm most interested in with the book is just what they're going to do with the spirit portal and somehow getting to a point where they're developing the human spirit conflict. I don't know right now where exactly they're going to head with it because 
um, they they kind of just repeated old territory in um, in part one, and it seems like they're going to have a lot to do in this book, as I just read out from the description. Like there's still there's almost the entirety of the presidential election stuff to set up in that. Apart from like I think a character pointing out that Julie is very organized, there was no real setup from part one that Julie is immediately going to be the next one to be president. We only knew that for part one because of the description for part two. So they're going to have to really move that along and with that it's going to be a, a big thing in the book how they present Raiko, how they present Julie and then Write it in a way where it's not just that we're just all for Julie and then Raiko has nothing. Because I was somewhat critical but also somewhat interested with part one with how it presented Raiko because they were, they really doubled down on like he is making bad decisions. He's got this kind of election campaign manager guy who's telling him some good things to do but he's not in a good position as leader. Um, so... I, I really hope they have something happening here where like it's not just oh Raiko he's a bad guy he doesn't have any good like uh, ideas as president because I, I think there's a little bit more to in a way be gained if you do present Raiko as like once we get down to it there's an election going on it's Julie versus Raiko and we actually get into like what their ideas are for president and um, maybe Julie has some ideas we disagree with maybe Raiko actually has some good ideas when we get down to it and some of the other stuff around the scenes has been a problem for him, but uh, maybe some stuff uh, he actually has learned from and is actually going to be a good president. Um, in a way, kind of like explain to us why he was elected in the first place, because it it's right now kind of feels like, oh, he was a non-bender candidate, so they selected him in the aftermath of book one, and that's the only reason he was selected. Um, so what what's, what's happening here? Um, and... With that, I don't know how much focus you can even give it, because even part three, I don't think the part three description for Turf Wars mentions the presidential race, so I wouldn't even really be confident that, like, beyond Julie kind of determining that, like, I'm going to run against Raiko in the race, I don't even know if, like, Turf Wars as a plot point is going to get to the point where we elect a new president. I feel that might be just an ongoing thing behind the scenes over the first couple of comics, rather than, like, by the end of Turf Wars, we'll knew who, know who our new president is. Because there, there has to be some sort of a time skip to get to the point where the 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 election has actually happened, people have voted, and then the results come out. It might be a very, very end of Turf Wars thing, but we'll, we'll have to see. Um, in a way, having Julie be the new president and like uh, her and Raiko be like the, the presidential couple, uh, her and Varric, I mean, be the presidential couple, could be a really cool thing. I think that would actually be a good position to have it in. But I also wonder, does Varric being her husband actually have a negative effect uh, to the rest of the people on how they view Varric and that, oh, but your husband owns this massive company and what, what, is that a good thing to, to do? To have, a, to, to have um, the president and someone they're close to be, you know, the, the owner of, of a huge business co corporation how does that work? And then I suppose what they could do with that also is that we have two clear candidates is he could potentially have Asami and Korra be on opposite sides. That could be a way to add a little bit of conflict between them of maybe Korra immediately wants Julie to be uh, the new president because she hates Raiko. Maybe Asami has a, some, some good reason for why she wants Raiko to still be the president uh, or they could reverse it. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, with, with Korasami, uh, I do feel they eventually need to get to a point where they add sort of a, some sort of a little conflict between the two of them. Just because I feel addressing some sort of an issue that the two have is a good way to actually develop them as a couple to show that, oh wait, here's where they disagree on points. Because Asami, I think, still in over the course of this series, needs to get individual character development to really stand out on her own as a character because it feels like in most of the conversations they have Korra and how well we know Korra and how defined her character is we know her strengths we know her flaws she kind of ends up dominating so many of the scenes with Asami because 
Asami feels so still undefined as a character. So I hope we get to see like, oh, maybe Asami has some, uh, you know, ideas that we may not agree with about where to go with things. Of like, she maybe wants the candidate who is more supportive of the businesses, maybe at the expense of the people, whereas Korra will be all for the candidate who supports the people the most. Um, that could be something that, like, Asami's interest in, you know, making sure the future industries does well could actually cause an issue between the two of them. And given that we... It's it's kind of weird, I don't even know if I should bring it up, but it's in the description for part three. We know Asami at the end of this book, to some degree, is going to get kidnapped. Uh, it's a weird thing for them to kind of spoil ahead of time that, more or less, that's what has to be the ending of the book now. That the cliffhanger will be that Asami gets kidnapped. Um... That's an interesting one because Asami is a good fighter, so it has to be this situation where they're either cops completely by completely by surprise, or they somehow Tokuga and the spirits or something like that end up like managing to completely overwhelm them, and Asami gets uh, taken. Um, it it could create an interesting dynamic, but I suppose it it's also a situation where. What do you do with Kor and Asami's relationship before the kidnapping? And how do you make part three then not just be like Korra saving Asami and they're separate until Korra gets Asami back? Like that, that doesn't that doesn't really seem like the best idea to go with the like relationship development. Because um, that's what we really need. We just need time with these characters to really get to know what their dynamic is. Um and then I think the problem with this book is probably going to be how it uses other characters. So you have your Korra, your, you have your Asami, um, you have Raiko, Julie, Tokuga, Wan Yong Kum. Utilizing the rest of the characters, I think, is where the book might struggle. Because it, it was definitely a struggle for part one of just, okay, we got a little scene with Tenzin here. Here's Kaya doing something. Um, here's Janora for a little bit. Like, who are we really making stand out as the, the key characters here. Because Mako and Bolin are on like the cover for part one, but then like they didn't really do anything all that much in part one. Like uh, the hope with Mako I suppose would be that he very very quickly accepts Korra and Simon's relationship. I, I think they went more for humor with the scene at the end of uh, part one when he found out, but there's always the 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 potential that they might go down some sort of a way where he has some sort of an issue with that. I hope they don't and they just jump in and he's fine with it. Um, I like more scenes with Mako and Bolin because they obviously have to deal with some of the triple threat stuff and it seems like they're going to be dealing with the, the housing crisis in terms of the direct problems that that is causing. So you can sort of see maybe where things are going to come in where like probably the housing crisis as well as maybe how to deal with the spirit portal are going to be the two key current event issues that the president uh, race is going to be based around about who has the best idea to immediately get people into new homes uh, and then also tackling the issue of like there's a spirit portal right in the middle of our city how do we police this in any way what do we do with the spirits how do we deal with spirits and the potential issues that they could cause as well as the fact that we also have to be mindful of the spirits we can't just have anyone who wants to just walk into the spirit world and potentially get hurt, injured, uh, or something worse by interacting with the spirits in there. Because we know they don't like humans interacting, so we know there's a there's an issue going on there. So um, those are the questions that need to be addressed. And then I suppose Cora is going to be involved in that because she's going to have to have a heavy involvement in any choice that's made around the spirit portal because she is the one who knows the most about it uh, in terms of the, the interaction between humans and spirits. That two people who don't really know much about the spirit world, is it really good for them to make the decisions about the spirit world when Korra is the one who's actually the most knowledgeable? So that could be a big thing about um, uh, Korra making a, deciding on something. And that potentially is where the issue comes in, in that I don't know if it's me if it's meant to be set up as a potential issue between Korra and Asami, but they there was a notable moment where, you know, Asami kind of speaks over Korra about, so what do we do about the spirit portal? And Asami's like, 
no, we have to keep it private. Like we can't let like bad people into the spirit world. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but that's the gist of kind of what she was saying that, you know, only people who specific people in a way that like I choose should be allowed into somewhere as special as that. Whereas Cora's perspective was more of like, mm, like what she was going to say, which she says later on in the book that, no, we need to make, in my mind, you know, like a kind of nature reserve kind of park around the spirit portal. Some, somewhere that focuses on nature, that it's a, at least a section around the spirit portal where the spirits can be okay with coming out, uh, and that humans can go into that park <clears throat> to interact with the spirits, and it's just this section of the city that is um, devoted to kind of wildlife, spirit kind of sanctuary type stuff. And for the most part, Cora basically went with the idea of like, leave it open, people who can go if they want, Spirits can come and go if they want, but there's some level of like, it's exclusive to this park and we'll deal with whatever happens after that when we come to it. So they might come to to blows over that of just a Sammy being a little bit precious about the spirit portal and uh, the, the spirit world, whereas Core realizes that it needs to, there needs to be some level of openness. Uh, if, there, if there's any hope to really bring humans and spirits together again. Um, so th that's where I think a lot of the debate will come in. Uh, it will be interesting to see if like Mako and Bolin end up taking sides from their perspective of like um, dealing potentially with the people who are who, for, where issues are arising that they're required to help with. Um, similarly with like the airbenders of course we know that they will want to protect the spirit portal and obviously would be supportive I think to a degree of Korra's idea but might not like the openness that she's proposing in that she's definitely proposing somewhere in between the full amusement park and uh, Asami's basically like uh, only let very specific people in and um, she's coming down somewhere more in the middle of like let's create a park around this place um, and be you know, respectful type thing and um, so there's that um, I hope, I'd like to see, you know, them actually get into an arc with Mako and Bolin. Uh, I hope Mako, at some point in the book, gets his arm fully healed so he can be fully back in action. Um, I do have a feeling, though, that they might keep that as, like, the gimmick for Mako over the course of this book, where he has to, um, for the most part, stay out of the action. And that's why Bolin is there with him, to kind of be the kind of, you know, the fighter while Mako does the... Uh, the specific work that relates to kind of what was being a police officer, um, but I do hope that gets healed. It would, it probably gives him an opportunity to maybe come into contact with Cora again if he needs to get more healing done on his arm, um, and just in general, once once she, once he's done with the injury, it kind of feels like okay, you can then properly start this arc potentially with him and Lin of actually moving towards like Lin really seeing Mako as like this really really important per person in the police force and potentially next in line to lead the police force I I'd like to see something like that to to give Mako an importance and then you know you have Bolin there as the kind of up-and-coming kind of police officer and I still don't really know if there's going to be a larger direction for Bolin now that he's in this police officer role because it feels a little bit like he'll be here doing this for a while but that it doesn't really feel like maybe this is something they'll stick with Bolin with, that he'll just be a police officer going forward. Um, just because it feels like they're now suddenly, oh, we don't know what to do with Bolin. We don't know where to just put him as like a just a permanent role for him. So we'll just stick him with Mako and see where that goes. Um, I'd like to see if he finds somewhere to go where like maybe over the course of this journey he realizes that like, okay, I don't want to be a full police officer, but maybe I'll be some sort of a like... Uh, relief kind of aid worker or something like that who who helps with that sort of thing because he liked doing that as part of the earth empire didn't like the the politics relating to like the leadership of the earth empire he may not like some of the similar stuff that's in play in the the police force um but um beyond that um i i don't know if like Korra like ind individually is going to get a ton of development over the course of this arc Probably it'll, it'll. I think it'll obviously be stuff with her and Asami that you'll have to address. It'll, I think, address Korra's view on the kind of politics of the city a little bit more. I think that will have to be something that's addressed, and um, just w regards to how she now deals with 
that in a new presidential election, and she's present here fully for it, um, we have to see, of course, how she um, really lays down her, her opinions with regards to the candidates, and does she have any say in influencing it, that, and that it, it is part of the election that, like, Julie and Raiko both try to get Cora on their side, knowing how, like, popular of a person she is in the city and maybe they try to influence her but she has to deal with the fact that she can't actually choose sides because she I suppose politically can't really be seen to like side with specific candidates and that's probably why she didn't seem to have any sort of involvement or know all that much about President Raiko once he was elected and um, she probably had to stay out of that one but now that she's in a position where we know she's at least decent when it comes to making these sort of decisions. She still kind of can't be involved in that because she has to be neutral. And this might be where it comes into a play where there's people, her friends, maybe even Asami, asking Cora to make a hard decision politically when she actually can't. And it might explore the idea of um, the neutrality of being the Avatar a little bit more, where she can't actually be a full-on political figure that's why she kind of has to speak more to just the people in terms of like uh, I will help you and do the best that I can but I can't really directly influence politics and make all this stuff happen um, which was another kind of part of part one that was a little bit weird where like Cor goes out gives that speech she comes back in and like Tenzin and everyone else seems to be very happy with how the speech went but Asami's just kind of like nah I'll do, I'll do something more practical and Cor's a bit taken aback like but you, you don't see the importance of like giving the people hope whereas Asami seems to be more like yeah but the people will have more hope if we just give them houses and th th that could be an aspect of it um, so that, that that brings them into to conflict um, but as I said like As Asami needs the development Korra we're gonna I think see her maturity at this point in terms of how she deals with all this stuff and there she could end up at the end of part two with a lot on her plate where she's being pulled in all these different directions, her girlfriend has just been kidnapped, she just has to get stuff done at this point. Maybe that's where she teams up with Mako and Bolin, and that's maybe the setup for the fight with Tokuga, because Tokuga doesn't, and Korra don't really have a feud as such. Korra, of course, w doesn't want the gangs to be doing stuff, but he seems to be personally blaming her for what happened to him. So, uh... The, the, the only hope there would be that potentially Tokuga, in being part spirit, they sort of reveal that if you're powerful enough and can like control the spirit side of yourself, you can then control spirits as well. And it gives you an extra power and ability. Um, and that gives him like a the ability to maybe turn spirits dark, which I think that was the big thing with the part three description, is that um, it seems like Tokuga eventually gets to a point where he can turn spirits into dark spirits and um, really, really cause some havoc. So we could see that right towards the end of part two as a major plot point, which could bring Korra's spirit bending back into play of like, if you have to kill off Tokuga, it'd be very interesting to see how spirit bending works on like a half human, half spirit. Um, in terms of, do, can she spirit bend the stuff out of him? Like, can Korra as the avatar reverse the spirit morphing process or what? And then given that they've set this up, could we see other characters get spirit morphed if the spirits are going to be angry like they are? Um, so does that. Um, I hope the airbenders get a little bit more to do. That I, pro I think we'll probably see them put down their flag with regards to, you know, maybe siding politically with the whatever side is more lenient about the spirit portal, about how to actually, I suppose, whichever side is more respectful with the spirit portal. Uh, and fits in more aligned with the, what they're going for, um, but beyond that, I'm I'm not really sure because I think the problem with part one of Turf Wars was that it didn't present enough of the plot to really allow us too much of a staging ground really to build off to actually speculate all that heavily on in what's going on, um, which makes it so weird that the, 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 the previews for the books have basically kind of spoiled key plot points about the whole Asami kidnapping thing. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's some weird stuff. I, I think this book might end up being very, very political. And I, I think they need to find a good balance of making it kind of political and 
addressing like the different characters' views on it, without it just feeling like really part two of Turf Wars is about different characters' thoughts on a housing crisis. And like, I'm sure that's of interest to some people, but it's like really in the universe where we have like bending spirits, human spirit conflict, we're focusing on a housing crisis during a presidential election, like. Well, is, 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 that, is that what we have to look forward to in this book? Uh, so that I think they have to find the blend of like having it be interesting politics and not just being boring politics. Kind of like you know, like the prequels did in Star Wars where um, while some people don't like any politics, I, I felt like the, the kind of basic simple to the point politics that they did in those movies actually allowed you to really understand the world and what was going on and made for some interesting situations. Um, the positive was that they were talking more about like, here's how you know a trade blockade affects this planet, and this character can uh, gain like sympathy with other characters because it's his planet that's being blockaded. Will we see that sort of those sort of political maneuvers going on here? I'm not too sure, but um, I think I, I hope Julie kind of I think jumps into the spotlight a bit and becomes uh, we get more development from her in terms of like what are her views on things. Will we disagree with Julie on any of her kind of politics when they come up, if we even get to that? Because again, these books are only 72 pages, that seems like a lot, but when you actually get down to reading one of these comics, you blow through those pages very, very, very quickly. And there are times at which, you know, especially more recent comics, have not used their page count particularly effectively. Maybe overly long fights, and fights that aren't particularly important, and... Um, dialogue pages that go on for maybe just a little bit too long and don't address the plot enough so it feels like there's so much to do but when the book actually comes out they might choose to very much focus over only on very specific things I think the biggest mistake they could make with this book is having the balance be the same way that part one was where part one was like 70% Korra and Asami set up and then like 30% what's going on with the rest of the plot that needs to be I think almost reversed whereas I think like devoting like 20-30% of the book to Korra Asami is actually good and um, they need the plots to be developed here because um, I don't know outside of presenting more of a conflict with the relationship due to the plot how you're necessarily going to get the same interest out of the Korra Asami stuff as you did with the part one scenes where like you had the really unique dynamics of them uh, telling Kor's parents. Um, here's the, the scenes with Kaya. Um, here's them telling their friends. You don't really get those kind of same moments here in that it's now most of the key people who need to know know. And now let's see where we go. The other thing politically is, will they do something where Julie or Raiko have something in their like campaign plan or some sort of political view where they don't support same-sex relationships. That is going to be a big thing if they do that. If, because they commit to that, it's this thing where like, whoa, I don't know if we can ever get back on board with that character again. That's, that's how this feels like because of what they did with part one, where the only character that the writers felt kind of comfortable enough in presenting as being any sort of way not fine with same-sex relationships with Sozin. I don't see them having the the guts to really go through with saying that like a Julie or even a Raiko is not supportive of these relationships. I, I kind of feel like they'll just maybe skip past that, but I'll be shocked if they do anything with it. Um, but that could ca cause a bit of a debate uh, over how they propose to do it. Because um, it, it feels very much like one of those things where like, with the fandom, that that's probably one of the more evil things you can kind of have a character do is just kind of uh, present them as not being supportive of these relationships, especially in this book where we're being so you know supportive around them, and so that's going to be something about to look out for. Just given that it's a huge focus of this book is on Kor and Sam's relationship, do any of the characters that we touch on throughout this book have an issue with the relationships? Then uh, I don't think that the writers feel particularly comfortable in making any of our known characters not comfortable with it. And because of that, it feels like a very uh, 
very oddly focused book when like everyone's just accepting of it except like the most evil character in the entire franchise but yeah that's my my basic thoughts on turf wars part two um i wish i could be more specific but part one was so so vague about everything that was going on i i don't really know how specific i can really get so they're my thoughts what are your thoughts on the book how excited are you for turf wars in just over two weeks time um but uh, yeah, I will be reviewing the book when it comes out. I've sent in a request to Dark Horse to get a review copy. I don't know if I'll hear back from them about that. Just because communication-wise, they've been all over the place. Um, the last couple of times I've requested review copies. Um, so it's just, it's sort of one of those situations where like, you'll see a review when you see a review. I don't really know for sure if I'll be able to get an early review out. Um, but I'll do everything I can to get a review out the day the book comes out. We'll do our usual podcast review, uh, I'll do a written review up on the site. You'll see all the usual content from me that I usually do when there's a new comic release. Um, and of course, when the preview pages go live, I will do a video showing them off and analyzing them on my channel. But uh, yeah, that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.